Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Human Rights, Gender and Youth session. Uh, we're going to have an interesting discussion concerning these themes from now on. Uh, for a setting the scene phase to explain the, the, the sequence and the, the dynamics of the work, uh, for this afternoon I would like to pass the floor to MAG member Renata Kino Hibeiru. Please, Renata, you have the floor. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the main session, Human Rights, Gender and Youth. I'm just uh, doing a quick set the scene to explain how this session will, will work. You will have our speakers here, which will speak in the order that they are here uh, from uh, my right to left. And uh, they will each speak three minutes each, and then you are the speakers. This chair is yours. We are going to have roaming mic, and we're going to walk around you, and they're going to ask you for contributions and insights to this theme. Our theme is human rights, gender, and youth as a direct link to internet governance. Okay, so I really hope uh, you feel inspired to become a speaker today and join this amazing team, and uh, we have a very fruitful discussion. Thank you. So thank you very much, Hanata. Thank you very much, Hanata. Uh, as you know, the, the IGF has been under severe criticism and, and uh, uh, a, a need for more concrete outputs over the past years. There are areas where these developments, where the developments that we need in digital policy are particularly important. And I think we do have a couple of interesting initiatives where, where the, the forum has helped advance important policy and important questions in the, in the realm of, of gender, of youth, and of human rights. So in this session here, our speakers in, in, in their first rounds, they're going to address basically three of the questions that are proposed in the panel. First is, how do the themes human rights, gender, and youth intersect with internet governance primarily? The second is, what has been done so far in this thematic intersectional debate that should be highlighted in terms of policy? And the third item we're addressing is, what is urgently lacking in this thematic intersectional debate that should be formulated, publicized, or adopted as policy? Uh, Madeline, would you start? Thank you very much. You have the floor. Hi there, uh, my name is Madeline McSherry and I do public affairs for the High Level Panel on Digital Cooperation, which is a new initiative started by the UN Secretary General uh, that's been tasked with co-creating a series of policy recommendations um, for, uh, for the, in the digital space. Um, and we've uh, set out sort of three main focus areas. One is we're gonna be looking at values and principles of digital cooperation which, by the way, is, really refers to sort of multi-stakeholder collaboration around digital issues. Um, two, it's methods and mechanisms. And three, we've outlined um, a series of priority action areas, one of which is going to be human rights and human agency. Um, and I, I will say that uh, although I'm here as a speaker on the panel, my role is primarily to listen. Um, because what we're, we're doing in this process of co-creating these policy recommendations is really to engage with stakeholders. And where youth and gender really come into our work is that we're really trying to focus on underrepresented groups and making sure that their voices are incorporated into this policy, uh, into policy debates. Um, I'll maybe just outline a few themes that have been emerging from our consultations and from what we've been hearing. Um, one is to focus on human rights, but to really pay attention to human agency as well. So that means we might talk about things like access, but um, what's really important is that what we ask, how, what kind of agency do we have um, to capitalize on that access? What kind of control do we have over the content we see, the way that we use digital technologies? Um, two, there's a clear avoidance of tech solutionism, um, wanting to make sure that um, we talk about how we can leverage tech for good, but understanding the nuances and limitations. Um, and then three, also a return to analog structures of, um, of the need of the protection of human rights um, and really needing to kind of strengthen those uh, to bear the, the digital load. Um, 
So, so yeah, as I said, I, um, the important thing that I want to emphasize here is our outreach strategy and making sure that we're reaching out to underrepresented groups, um, making sure that women's voices um, that are traditionally marginalized are included, um, and engaging with young people as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you're addressing by those dimensions the, the hardest issues in multi-stakeholderism in general and of the Internet Governance uh, Forum in particular. So next for this introductory uh, talk, I'll uh, call for the presence of, of John Carr. John is a, is a researcher in child abuse. And uh, please, you have the floor, John. OK. Um, so I'm, for those of you who weren't in the previous panel, uh, or the previous meeting in this room, uh, I'm representing ECPAT International, uh, which is a global NGO uh, based in Bangkok, in Thailand. Uh, we have member organizations in around 120 different countries on each of the continents. Um, and from our title, our title is End Child Pornography, Child Prostitution and, Tra and Child Trafficking. So some of the issues that our member organizations are dealing with uh, in different countries, um, different parts of the world, uh, as you can imagine, some of the some of the most sort of nitty gritty and darker bits of some of the most horrible things that can happen to children anywhere on or off uh, uh, the internet. And whilst obviously, therefore, child protection, child safety, the welfare of children are a predominant uh, concern of of ECPA International and the work that our members do it would be a mistake and it's a mistake that's often made to assume that therefore we see the internet only as a threat only as a source of danger to children and young people quite the contrary we see the uh, tremendous positive possibilities that the technology can present to children particularly children in underrepresented groups and marginal Groups. This might be the only way in which, for example, they can access information about their rights, the only way in which they can uh, assert those rights, gain information about health, opportunities, a whole, a whole range of things. So we absolutely get the, the positive dimension of what the internet can present to children and young people um, around, around the world. Um, and we have as our kind of cornerstone, our touchstone, the UN uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child one of the, I think, the most widely adopted uh, convention in the UN's history, or the most widely and most rapidly adopted convention in the UN's history. And that uh, charter, for example, speaks unequivocally, unambiguously, about children's rights to access information from whatever media or from whatever source, and also speaks about children's rights of assembly, rights of association, and children's rights to express themselves through what, whatever media might be available. And we regard those uh, rights of children to be of paramount importance, not subordinate to, not uh, distinct from, but of paramount importance. But of course, those rights only mean something if children can enjoy them uh, meaningfully, and, and that's only possible if the environment is as safe as it possibly uh, can be, which is why we do tend to focus uh, some of our work on um, on aspects of uh, protectionism and, uh, uh, and so on. But we always strive to ensure that it's in, in balance because you could protect uh, children from every single potential risk in perpetuity by locking them in the living room and never letting them out of the house. That's an impractical and, and, and stupid approach. And we try to reflect this uh, by bringing a, a sense of balance to, to the work that we do. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about the internet governance issue because that's part of what this agenda is about. So just very quickly, I mean, you might have gathered from the description of the organization, ECPAT International, that some of our members are working in some very kind of very dangerous and difficult parts of the world in some very dangerous and difficult situations. But let me talk about some of our members in Europe, for example. Some of our member organizations in Europe Every single penny, every single centime, dime, pound, whatever it might be that they raise, comes from the public. And when the public give this money to children's organizations, some of them get no money at all from government. When they get this money from, from members of the public, it's because members of the public want to help these organizations to help children. And some of our members, for example, are working almost exclusively 
with children in the refugee camps, uh, children that have come out of Syria and the Middle East and so on to escape the war zones, who've come, come to, you know, over the Mediterranean, many died in, uh, in the attempt. They're now living in terrible conditions in all kinds of danger and so on. And so our member groups are raising money to go and work with those children in those camps. It's very, very hard to tell those organizations, well, actually, if you could just stop spending money on that sort of work and send John to Brazil or Australia or San Diego or wherever it might be to talk to Google and talk to Microsoft and talk to the United Nations about how the internet should be made better for children. It's just not, it just doesn't fly. It's not reasonable. It's not, uh, it's not realistic to expect children's organizations to be able to divert resources from that type of work or you know, helping a child who's been sexually abused with psychotherapy, doing a class with teachers, and yet that is the reality <laughs> of, of what it comes down to when it comes to questions of internet governance. I live in London, I'm British. Getting to Paris, no big deal. Uh, but you know, you, can't, you cannot participate uh, in many of the internet governance structures if you don't have the money to pay the, the airfares, the accommodation, and so on. And I know that the IGF and ICANN and all of these things, they have scholarship schemes and quite rightly they are focused on people from the developing world rather than from Europe and the richer countries. But actually, you know, children's organizations in Britain and France, Germany, America and so on, they, they haven't, they're not equipped, they're not, they don't have the resource base to enable them to, to participate in many of these internet governance forums. And for all the fine words that we've heard from the very beginning, about the importance attached to this, it actually has never materialized. And what that says to me is that actually it isn't really a priority. Uh, because if it was a priority, it would have happened. Um, <clears throat> and fi my final uh, illustration of this point, Net Mundial, okay? The statement that came out of Net Mundial, 2014. Now, if you remember, those of you who've been around the IGF long enough, uh, there's normally one IGF a year, but in 2014 they had an extra one, and it was in, Brazil, uh, in Sao Paulo in Brazil. We had a budget to go to one IGF per year. We didn't have a budget to go to two IGFs, so we didn't go to Sao Paulo. We couldn't. We didn't have the money to go to Sao Paulo. The statement that came out of, um, uh, out of Net Mundial, everybody who I know is into that governance space says, fantastic statement. The best distillation, the best expression of internet governance prim principles ever to have emerged from, from human endeavor. Guess what? What is the one word that is missing from that statement? Child or children, youth, young. None of those four words appear anywhere in the Net Mundial statement. Why? Because there were no children's organizations or there weren't enough children's organizations organizations in the room speaking up about it. Now, it doesn't mean that the people who attended Net Mundial were bad people who didn't care about children. Of course not. But it, what it does mean is that the people who were there had their own agenda, their own things to do, their bosses, their companies, their organizations had sent them there with quite specific things to achieve, and they achieved them, or I assume they achieved them, but nobody was there in the room who concerned and focusing on children's voices children's rights, and that's why they were completely missed out. The rights of people with disabilities were mentioned, the rights of people in underserved regions were mentioned, and I'm glad that they were. This is not a competition between disadvantaged groups, but children were not even mentioned in the Net Mundial statement. And that's really a serious failing uh, uh, on everybody's parts, I guess. But you can't, I mean, what was that, uh, what Jerry said in the thing? Nothing about us without us. Yeah, I like that. I'm going to use that. That's very, very good. <laughs> you need to have the voices in the room or else the voices are overlooked. Thank you very much, Jean. Thank you very much for the, for the effort in bringing this, the, the delicate of this balance of giving access enough so as to inform children and not, that access does not jeopardize their development and also for this very complete tackling of two of our main issues in the, in the, in the session, which is uh, how does the theme you work with relate to internet governance and what is missing? What are things that are missing? Thank you very much for this first round. So next we have, uh, uh, we have Marianne Franklin from Reganet. 
Ah, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Je parlerai maintenant en anglais et j'espère lentement. Um, uh, thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm here and I'm very honored to be here on the youth panel. Um, I'm representing uh, the Global Internet Governance Academic Network as an educator. And the first thing I want to say is that intersectionality is an academic term, but what it means, in fact, is that we start with complexity and we do not shear away from complexity. And that's the challenge that we have been issued. And I believe it's only by embracing complexity <clears throat> that we will move forward. Simplicity is a tool of the dominant. Second thing I'd like to say is that um, there are enormous transformations happening in the higher education sector, in high schools and primary schools and kindergartens. And a lot of this is technology push, a lot of it is marketing, a lot of it is based on selling tools and platforms to overworked, under-resourced managements, um, to a generation that is used to going online as a matter of course. So there are advantages to this, but there's an assumption that students have a certain level of literacy, a certain level of critical skills, as if these things in themselves are uh, one size fits all. So I'm always challenged in my own classroom to figure out what students think they know, <clears throat> what they do know, and what they are able to find out more about in terms of just operating some of these devices in ways that are not default uh, settings. But this transformation is happening in terms of content. And as the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet also says, following on from the Universal Declaration, the right to education is also about the right to education on and about whatever the internet is and what it will be. But also this is linked to our Article 11, which is the right to culture and access to knowledge, which is more and more based online. Much more scholarship is happening online in real time than it used to. And then it flows straight into, of course, the rights of children um, in online environments, which my colleague will speak to. So um, we can't disconnect the offline from the online and sort of... Um, uh, silo these two, uh, two ways of being in the world. So um, the other thing I'd like to comment on is that the IGF is a meeting along with UNESCO meetings, ICANN meetings, IETF meetings, you name it, are now objects of research for students. The archives that are being built and being archived and channeled are now things that people want to find out more about. So an extraordinary array of methodologies are being applied to the very words I am now speaking, using digital tools, using discourse analysis, using critical gender-based discourse analysis, looking at our demographics on this panel and asking where are the children under 15, asking where are the students, uh, are there enough of them? So this is now an object of research and we should be conscious of this as we meet. Um, so the next generation is already looking at this generation. And I'd like to finish my comments, I'd like to try and keep within the three minutes, I horribly am not. Um, but my last comment is that I'd like to commend the Internet Governance Forum, the MAG and the Secretariat for the hard work over the last 10 years to make participation possible through a particular use of technologies. Now I know WebEx, the platform we use, has come under criticism for lots of reasons. But I have my students signed on for this Internet uh, Governance Forum meeting. People are able to participate who cannot afford the plane fare. There's still a long way to go. There's still a lot of levels that we can improve that participation of, but let's not overlook that this is the one UN-hosted meeting where it's taken very seriously to deploy technologies to allow and enhance access and participation um, in very real ways. So I'd just like to commend everyone here. Um, but let's, at the end of the day, let people make their own minds up, whether they're three, whether they're 13, whether they're 23, whether they're 93. Thank you very much. Very much, Marianne, for this strong inclusion message. Uh, and next, uh, we have Minda Moreira from the Dynamic, Dynamic Coalition on Internet Rights and Principles. Minda, once again, relation with internet governance. How does it relate to internet governance? How? What has been done? What is yet to do? Thank you very much. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, and uh, I'm representing the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition, which is part of the um, IGF, so Internet Governance Forum. Um, and this is uh, an open network of individual and organizations uh, which are committed to make human rights and principles work uh, for the online environment. 
Um, our main document, uh, Marianne has referred, and is the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet, and was published in 2011, and is now translated into um, uh, 10 languages, I think. Yes, uh, 10 languages, including uh, my own languages, uh, which is Portuguese. Um, we are pleased to see the Human Rights, Gender and Youth uh, main session finally here at the IGF. Uh, these are very important issues uh, that our coalition and others within the IGF community have been discussing over the last decade. Uh, gender equality and children and youth rights resonate directly as well with the work that uh, uh, we have been doing. And this takes me to a, a young person that I know called Eva. Um, she can't read or write and she can't count past 10 or 20, she doesn't fully grasp concepts of good and bad, and if she tell her that she's a human, she will possibly deny because she's only a big girl. Uh, but she can easily unlock a smart device to look at pictures, listen to songs, or to visit YouTube to see a favorite Peppa Pig character. And she's three years old. My point here is that smart and network technologies are natural environment for all uh, the young generations and digital natives. A safe and protected environment should go hand in hand with empowerment. Uh, I think that empowering young people is a very important focus uh, and that's my main point here as well. It's important that their rights to access to information is fully enabled and that they are able to have a voice and to share ideas in the online environment and that this is free from hate speech, bullying and disproportionate forms of data collection or targeted advertising. Uh, these are issues that we cover in the charter um, and we have, for instance, in the Article 12, the rights of children and the internet, and we have uh, the right to benefit from the internet, the freedom from exploitation and child abuse imagery, the right to have their views heard, and finally, the best interests of the child. So I think these are all important issues. And as Eva grows into adulthood, I hope that our work in promoting gender equality through the Charter uh, will uh, enable Eva, as a young woman, to be able to fully participate in the online environment, as per our Article 2 on the right to non-discrimination in internet access, use and governance, and most particularly clause C in gender equality. Thank you. Thank you, Minda. That was a really strong thread of messages uh, towards the protection of child and youth, and in, in, in the end, for the past two speakers, resorting to an instrument which is a concrete output of internet governance eff efforts. Thank you very much. We're moving on now to Lilian Nalwoga. Uh, please, Lilian, you have the floor. Um, uh, thank you. Um, my intervention is mainly on uh, bringing more women online. And um, unfortunately, I think I have more questions than answers. And my questions go, um, how do we get more women online? Um, how do we get more women into policy discussions? Um, when I was before um, coming here, I received uh, several requests from uh, different session um, organizers to, you know, recommend to them speakers, mainly uh, speakers from um, maybe Africa, but gender, who can speak on issues of uh, security and that sort of thing. And I really struggled to get these, um, these names. And whoever was forwarding or whichever name would come across was a man. So there's still a huge challenge. And, uh, when I look at the theme of this year's IGF, we are looking at the Internet Trust, but also the thing is right now we are looking, do we as women, do we trust the Internet? There's a lot of uh, gender-based violence online and probably it has not reached to that scale of being addressed to the level to which that we want to be addressed. Um, the other issue is um, I would like to commend um, 
the work of Wikimedia. I think on the um, March, there was a, an online activity where uh, there was a, um, a Wiki Loves Women, you know, a movement to try to profile women, you know, prominent women. We need to build uh, to profile role mono, models. We need to provide um, women uh, who can provide hope to the young girls who are bringing onto the internet to feel safe, but also to learn how to um, enjoy the true benefits of the internet. So my message is, yes, the internet governance program has provided as a platform for some of us women who are already empowered, but we also need to find strategies to bring more women online, not just as, uh, you know, engaging in policies, but also practical steps to ensuring our safety and uh, meaningful participation. Thank you again, Lilia. Uh, next, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Viviane Vinagri from Brazil. You, Viviane, you, you have been benefiting from some of the spaces, some of the still rare spaces that internet governance uh, creates and fosters for the youth. Uh, sadly, this is not a very extensive space yet, but I, could, I think we could hear from your experience how has it been happening? You connect your life and your, your objectives to, with internet governance. What do you think is, has, has been done so far and what do you think is missing in this scenario? Thank you very much. You have the floor. Um, thank you, Claudio. Thank you, everyone, for the opportunity. So, um, when I was invited to be here, I was told uh, I would have to uh, share my views regarding the last gender summit uh, Summit North America in Canada last year, and about the work that we do at the Youth Observatory, a uh, special interest group of Internet Society, and what we do to spread the human rights issues uh, to the to the young. So, uh, first of all, uh, the Genesis North America Summit is um, a forum just like IGF with a multi-stakeholder system that has with idea uh, the core uh, to debate about how we engage, how we include women and girls into science, into research, in the technological areas and in, at internet. Um, and uh, I could see, uh, because I'm from, Latin, uh, I'm from Brazil, Latin America, that the experience and debates between uh, Canada, United States, Europe, and it was very different. Like the problems that women face to be included, to engage at internet, oh, okay, sorry, uh, to engage at internet was different. So uh, it was a very good experience to see how, uh, how uh, organizations, how summits can be important uh, to engage women and uh, girls into technology and at internet. And mm -hmm. about the Youth Observatory, uh, since 2015, we do a work to try to include uh, youth on the debate of internet governance. So, uh, we always go to schools, we have uh, lectures on schools, we try to talk, teach them about the digital rights in order that they can uh, fight for them. Uh, we try to talk about them about cyberbullying, hate speech, freedom of expression, and a lot of other subjects that are so important for our community. And it's very interesting to see how um, they lack information, principally in Brazil, how there is certain places that they have no idea of how important the internet is. So uh, we try to, to show them that they have the power well, with internet and uh, they can be uh, anything that they want and they can grow with it. So, um, in order to do that in, uh, in the whole Latin America, we also do the Like IGF event, uh, before, one day before the Like IGF. And right now, we are spreading global. We are running now global, not only Latin America anymore. And uh, we have a lot of projects. And uh, I think uh, to engage youth, to engage women, we have to have projects uh, specifically towards them. 
like every region, every group, they have needs, they have problems, and it's a responsibility of the organizations that have to secure their rights to find the best way to get in and to include them at the internet ecosystem or even into science academia. And um, that's my considerations. Thank you, Claudio. Thanks a lot, Fiani. I would like to start encouraging you to think of a question of an intervention, an issue that would you would like to, to, to point out in the table. There's, a, there's going to be an open position here for all the, the forum. Uh, and next, we're going to Nidhi Goyal. She's an activist on young women and with disabilities in India. Nidhi, how does it relate? How do you relate your work with internet governance? Right. What has been done? What is yet to do? Thank you so much for um, inviting me on this panel. It's been a very interesting journey to hear the diverse perspectives, and I might echo some of the concerns, some of the principles, or some of the points brought out here. Um, we all know that when we talk about internet, internet governance, it's a broader approach than the basic infrastructure. We're talking about uh, addressing the legal, the developmental, the socioeconomic, and cultural issues um, along with the physical infrastructure of the internet. Um, keeping that in mind, if we look at the intersectionality that we're addressing today of human rights, gender, youth, and internet governance, and if we add layers of marginalization within that, talking particularly about gender and disability, about youth with disabilities, um, there are some of the perspectives that I wanted to lay. If we break this down and then think of intersectionality as a whole, if we look at human rights of people with disabilities, um, the immediate name, like for uh, children, the Convention on the Rights of the Child comes up, um, the main convention of human rights that comes up when you think about people with disabilities is the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Within that, um, the key principles have been, and I'm laying these out so that we make those connections between um, the human rights for uh, and disability and gender and youth um, with the internet principles that we have. Um, enabling environment, universal access, non-discrimination, reasonable accommodation. These are really the pillars of uh, the CRPD, as we call it. Um, we have articles specifically on gender and disability. We have articles uh, laying out access in terms of access to justice, in terms of access to information, in terms of right to be a an equal part of the community. And if we just think of the community as an online and offline community, we will be able to um, take the discussion further. Um, in Millennium Development Goals, disability found no place, but in Sustainable Development Goals, in seven goals, disability has a specific mention, including in goal five, which talks about gender. Um, so all those sustainable development goals talk about leaving no one behind and rights of all persons. Specific mentions and intentional inclusions are really, really important when we particularly want to address rights of marginalized groups. Um, here, there are many countries who've created laws and policies based on the CRPD and the SDGs. Uh, but what's important is to, I just want to lay out a little bit of a landscape of the Global South. So think about um, women with disabilities, even within gender, I will be talking about women with disabilities and youth with disabilities in these places. Um, we're talking about access to information, which is a right that's laid out. Um, access to information is really restricted. Um, students are still using very basic materials, many, many youths with disabilities are behind their peers at least by four or five years because of this lack of access. Physical infrastructure is not up to the mark, so there is, um, they, there is a lack of making connections, access to health services, access to justice systems are not possible. We're talking about social security gaps, so government assistance and support is missing, um, which ends up that Women and youth with disabilities do not have full participation, social, cultural, and economic and political activities. Isolation and stigma is huge. Now what the internet can do for them is providing, it's providing the platform to connect. It's providing the independence. And so we're going a step further from 
uh, thinking about the social and cultural access and looking at how independence and agency comes back when we're talking about a lot of women and young women and their right to express, in, particularly in communities and cultural setups where women are not allowed to speak freely and we see that internet and online spaces give them that opportunity, provides them the platform to voice their identity and their thoughts. It's the same with people with disabilities who could maybe literally or figuratively do not have the speech but do have thoughts, do not have the sight but do have a vision. Um, it, the biggest thing that the internet does uh, or online spaces do is it challenges the infantilization of women and youth with disabilities and gives them their agency back. That is why the idea is that we need the internet to be, or the internet governance principles to be inclusive, to think about providing security and privacy and everything else that we think for everyone, for even women and youth with disabilities, in order to have access for everyone. We always talk about principles and standards and we were in an earlier session today and uh, we heard a co-speaker cool saying that principles are always guidelines. They're there, they're plans. Standards are the tools that get us there. The key thing is to have to develop these standards and to ensure implementation of these policies and standards. Um, we have laws, for example, in India, we have um, the recent right of persons with disabilities access or all, all private and public establishments need to go accessible by 2019. And people haven't started work um, with their physical and uh, e-infrastructure. Um, countries are going digital more and more, but affordability and accessibility and access to digital spaces, and there is a huge digital divide in terms of um, social and infrastructural access as well. Um, what we need to think is when we talk about the principles and norms and the shared principles of internet governance, they won't be successful till we don't understand or realize that inclusion has to become the norm. Sensitivity in the shared principles is really important to include gender, youth, but also all the intersections within. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nida. Oh, thank you very much, Nida. Uh, I guess we could hardly have a more complete uh, landscape, of not only of the interest that you originally brought to the table, but the larger internet governance scenario. Thank you very much. Uh, for the messages and, and for the issues that you, you, you present that are really serious and grave and demand attention. So next, I, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Olga Cavalli. Olga, you are a technologist that has embedded human rights long ago. You are a realizer in education and capacity building for the region. And you are not only a promoter but also you yourself are, is a, are a role model for Latin America girls and young women, so you name it. How are you going to address this? You see, he's my friend. Uh, thank you, thank you very much Renata and Claudio for the nice word and Renata for the invitation. I must say that Nidhi said uh, everything I somehow wanted to say. She said it really, really nicely and very well explained. Just let me tell you that um, we organized a training program in Latin America called the South School of Internet Governance. We have just issued a book about internet governance and regulations in Latin America. It is for the moment in Spanish, but will be very, very soon. It's already translated into English and Portuguese. So if you follow us on, on social networks, you will, you will find the, the version soon. About your questions, uh, I, I myself find a, a mainly a positive impact of the internet in society in general. So there are negative aspects that some people are rising these days, but I think in general it's also, it's usually very, very positive. Um, what, what we have achieved, I think that um, we have achieved new voices, ways of people that can express their ideas, their voices, new revolutions that happened through social networks, through the internet. That didn't happen before. It was more difficult. I, when I tell my students that I went to university and I had no internet, they look at me, I say, how, how did you do it? How did you communicate? How did you coordinate with your teacher? How did you coordinate with your mates? How did you learn from other regions, from other friends? Well, we did, maybe 
well or bad, but we did at that time. But I think that that is, we have we have freedom, freedom to communicate, freedom to learn, freedom com to to uh, to speak, access to education, access to information that we didn't have before. I think that we, with this spaces, and I agree that not everyone can participate, it's difficult, but we have remote participation, we have these programs to bring young people. We have achieved a lot. Of course, there is a lot to be done, but um, I would say that uh, what has to be done is, we are still talking too much, for example, about women inclusion. We talk too much. I don't think we have achieved that much. I, I, I thought about a sentence a, a while ago and said, going from declaration to action. I, I have seen that some people have copied it, which I love. I love that they have copied the concept. It's because I think we talk a lot about uh, inclusion of women in leadership positions, inclusion of women in, in internet access, and it's too much talking. I don't see that much results as the talk. So that we have to work on that. I have talked many times about perhaps thinking about quotas for leadership position. I'm not saying it's good or bad. Let's think about it. So we talk, we have new access, we have um, more visibility of this issue. That, that is true. So governments and regulators have that information brought from the net, from the internet, the networks, from the specialists. Now we still have a way forward to go, one step ahead, and go from declaration to action. And I would just like to mention about the age thing. We, in the school that we organized this year, we started with the Argentina School of Internet Governance. We had um, like 30 um, high school students. They were boys and girls about 17 years old. That was very nice. And I have not heard anybody talking about older people, the difficulties that older people have to access devices, software, platforms. That is worrying. I have, my mom is 86, she's in Facebook, but she has some problems to access whatever we access at home. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olga, and thanks for one, one more example of a very interesting initiative. Uh, I believe Wataki has a, has a, a remote intervention for us. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Wata Gindungu, and I'm the Vice President of Digital Grassroots. We are a youth initiative that works to uh, uh, increase digital citizenships in local communities, and we are in 36 countries at the moment. We have a booth at the IGF. Feel free to visit it. Uh, I am moderating the online interventions, and uh, I would like to tell the online listeners who, if you're joining from you know, different countries, uh, feel free to join in when questions and comments are going on in, in the on-ground on session. So we'd like to hear your insights. May, uh, we want it to be as interactive as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Batak. Do you already have any, any remote, uh, do we already have any remote intervention? Or can we open the mic? Do you already have uh, anything? We, we can open the mic as they type. Oh, all yeah. right. Thank you. So, but it, it seems that we have a, already a first intervention here from the floor. Oh, we, we have one over there. W would you like to take a seat here? That's the spirit. <laughs> Thank you very much, welcome. Um, hello everyone, my name is Luisa Cortes Grego. I am 22 years old and I'm a Brazilian. I'm here with the Youth at IGF program, also with Viviane, she's in the same program as me. It's commanded by the CGI, the Internet Managing Committee in Brazil. And I would like to ask Marianne, uh, what types of structural changes in the IGF construction she would suggest to allow more youth and gender discussions? And I believe that question extends also to Olga. Um, uh, or more participation by youth and women in panels or other forms of presentations that may be introduced. Also, I would like to ask John Carr, if he had been there in Net Mundial, 
what would he choose to put in the declaration he, if he had only one principle in which you could mention youth? And also I would like to congratulate you all for an amazing panel, one of the best I've seen yet. Thank you. Very much. That's a pretty good beginning, isn't it? <laughs> Marian or, or Olga, if you... Thank you. Thank you for your question. It's very good. Let me tell you something. We organized several events. Having panels with equal number of women and men is not easy. Why? Because you invite a company or an organization and you, you don't have control of who they will send. You may do a recommendation, but you are not sure. And just let me tell you an anecdote. In, in ICANN, uh, with a friend of mine, she was a member of the board of ICANN, Asha Hembrajani from Singapore. We used to organize panels to analyze the lack of women in leadership positions in ICANN. And we expressly invited men to uh, do a specific men panel to talk about that, because they were leading these organizations, so stake, uh, supporting organizations within ICANN. They all sent women because they thought that it was a panel about gender. So it is that it's, it's extremely challenging. What we do as a hard rule, when we organize the School of Internet Governance, half and half ladies and men are fellows. That is a hard rule. Then with the panels, it is not that easy. And people criticize, and that's okay that criticize, but let me tell you that it's challenging. And some other things are challenging that we may talk after that. Thank you. Marian, please. Oh, yes, great question. I think um, the architecture of a room affects what happens. And we're in a very formal setting, a very historical formal setting. It's not necessarily hospitable. Uh, even though the three-year-old uh, Ava that we know here has managed very, very well. I think we need to allow children simply access. I think we need to uh, think about different modalities, more informal, lo-fi, paper-based, analog forms of participation. I think we need to think about deepening the technical practicalities of access so we can use a, a range of platforms the knowledge is there to combine these technologies so that it's not related to just one particular large platform that can be hard to use. I think our different formats, we try, we do our best. I think today is a great example to break the architecture, to, to disrupt the rigidity of the chairs, to move the microphones around, to dance. Um, and this allows children to feel part of this. But at the end of the day, this room is not designed for young people. It is not. So I think if we can start to redesign the architecture we have and create a space in there, we might be able to, within the live meetings, do something. But I'm all for different modalities and different formats around the main meetings to include children. Children have been here. They were here in Jao Pessoa, young, really young people, high school students. I think there needs to be resources to fund that kind of effort because it takes a lot of overheads and commitment. So let's find the resources to fund these initiatives. Um, and how about, just to finish off, not have this necessarily, if I may, with all due respect, necessarily have to be a training ground for the next generation of diplomats. Let it be simply an open forum where the children and the young people and the older people can say what they wish in the ways that work for them in a respectable way so that we can listen to a diversity of idioms within just the one language, um, different ways to talk about the same thing. I hope that helps, and I hope that answers your question. What about the what if question, John, if you were there? So First of all, um, herding children into a room and asking them to say what they think about the internet in general uh, is not child participation. It's, it's the worst kind of tokenism. I've seen far too much of it, um, and it doesn't actually contribute a great deal. It, maybe the organizers of the event can tick a box and say, oh yeah, we listen to children. They were, they were there, no, you could see them, they were there, and they were very young. And they were very unruly and groovy and funky and stuff like that. But that's, that's tokenism. It, it discredits the whole idea of children's participation. And, but you know what? 
Uh, I've got a lot of adult friends who I think would have difficulty engaging with the concept of internet governance and some of the stuff that we talk about at these events. What, what matters is the way you formulate questions and the, the, the depth and sincerity and honesty of the research that you do in making sure that children's voices are heard. Um, so that, that, would, that would be the point uh, I would make. Now on the, on, the, uh, on the principle, you know, I've been coming to, the only IGF I missed was the first one in Athens, okay? Every other one I've been to since, apart from Net Mundial, okay? That was the one we missed because we didn't have the money, okay? And I'm trying to think of any major improvement in internet governance that has happened since 2006. And do you know what? I can't think of one immediately. I can think of the way in which Google and Microsoft and uh, Facebook and Snapchat and a whole range of internet companies have changed their businesses and the way in which the reality of the internet has actually changed. But I can't think of any substantial change in anything that impacts on young people's lives in the, that could be reflected in internet, in, in internet governance because we, we, we expressly don't make decisions about anything. We just come here and we, it's a great event. I love, I love the IGF. It's the best networking event of its kind for people like me who are interested in internet policy and particular aspects of it. So um, if I had one thing to say, it would be that we need the companies to explain what they're doing about internet governance and how they are discharging their obligations to young people uh, who, who are their service users. In, we now have this embodied in law within the European Union in a thing called, an instrument called the GDPR, the General Data Protection uh, Regulation. There are lots of things you could say about that, but one thing that is fantastic about the GDPR is that it requires every company that provides a service to do a risk assessment of the service that it's providing. And that means in relation to children, if children are users, and by the way, child here means anybody under the age of 18, they have to work out what actually uh, is happening to children who use their service. Many good companies were already doing this, many companies were not doing it, and I would like to see that as a principle of internet governance. If you're an internet company, you need to think about who your users are and what the impact of your service is on those users. It's rather a long and complicated principle, uh, and it's not expressed in diplomatic language, but I hope you get the idea. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we have one more intervention here from Jerry Ellis. Uh, thank you, Jerry. Hello. Hi, Jerry Ellis here. I'll, I'll speak from the seat here, if that's okay. Um, I'm here at IGF res representing the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability, but seems that I was only asked five minutes before the session to speak, I'll just talk on my own behalf. Um, Nita Nindi said a lot of things that I would like to say, but maybe I want to talk a little bit about disability from a different point of view and how we got to a human rights approach. I'm, I myself am blind. It's appropriate because we're only two days beyond the day, the 100 centenary of the signing of the armistice which <clears throat> took place just outside Paris and at the end of the First World War the United Nations was set up. The first meetings were in Paris, the treaty were, was signed just outside of Paris, the first Congress took place in Paris before the headquarters moved to Geneva and of course it's its biggest first output was the Universal Declaration of Rights, and I think a lot of our rights r run from that. But if you look at the way that disability was seen in the early days, the World Health Organization held sway, and they had a, a view of disability that we were sick and we needed to be fixed. We were broken and needed to be fixed. So the international declaration, the, 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 the way that the WHO talked about disability was very much a medical model. As we came through the uh, International Year of Disability in the early 80s, through the decade of disabilities from 83 to 82 and, and, and movements on, we started to get this separation of people with disabilities and their own impairments, and my impairments is I'm blind, and their interaction with their environment. 
and uh, it, they still use the word handicap a lot, but it, it grew. And it came to full fruition in the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities that we've already heard about in 2006, where there are 50 articles. And it talked about impairment being the person's own disability, or impairment, if you like, medical situation, or whatever it is that causes uh, what we would traditionally see as disability. But disability is seen as the environment's failure to meet those needs. And that's a very important distinction. And I keep telling a story which I don't have time to tell here. But um, what I wanted to get to the point of was the solutions and the way that people with disabilities come up with solutions. People with disabilities often have a double uh, disadvantage. Like for instance, we heard about WebEx. And you said that people couldn't afford to fly here, but they were given WebEx and, and they, could, uh, they could contribute. Blind people couldn't because web, the WebEx interface is inaccessible. And I know I tried to present pr before last year uh, using WebEx and I couldn't because the interface wasn't accessible. And the only way a blind person could contribute to our uh, workshop earlier today was when a sighted person sat beside him. And the same is true uh, of education. In the poorer countries, maybe you'll find that the paper-based systems for doing education is not accessible to some people. The chalk and a blackboard, which I'm sure are still used in some places, may not be accessible. Even if it's using technology, the technology itself may not be accessible, or the train or bus that they're using. So even if education comes to the rest of society, people with disabilities are often still excluded. So we come up with solutions, and the main one that I've been mentioning today is universal design. Universal design is an approach that says we try to accommodate the needs of most. It's not a one solution fits all. It's a one solution fits one, where you try to say that you make systems adaptable to the needs of the person. And an example, and this is my last point, an example that we were given today was subtitling. And if you think of subtitling for our meeting here today, there's 11 other meetings going on. So you could, if you wanted to, go home tonight and read all the other meetings that you weren't able to attend. We were talking to a professor today who spoke at our conference who said that they've now taken subtitles from the 12 previous IGFs and done data mining to see how often was gender mentioned, how often was disability mentioned, and using a whole load, load of different ways of, of getting information. So I leave it at that. Our solutions are not just for people with disabilities. Accessibility is just good design. Thank you, thank you, Jerry. I'm sorry to interrupt, and the, the theme certainly needed a little bit more of, of extending, but I think it's time for us to try and go for the remote queue with Katarina, I suppose, or if Katarina is not ready with Shahul. Can you please? Um, Eileen from uh, Portugal is asking a question. Eileen is from Digital Grassroots, and she wants to ask about the GDPR. She wants to ask if you think that all companies will eventually implement it and if it's the best solution to protect the privacy of data users. Can anyone in the panel take it? Sorry? Um, yes, I was thinking about the people from the queue. Who can, oh, who can bring okay. them in? Cat oh, she didn't join the queue, okay. Yeah, I'm, I was hoping Katarina, if she is still there and, and, and available, or Shahul, to bring in their views. Adama, um, there is a question of intervention online um, through WebEx. I'm just going to read a Thank question. Um, are we good? Change the mic, please. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, intervention from online from Watagi, Kenya. He wants to know, the question is to all, he wants to know what do you think needs to be done to improve access for the older people online? What needs to change to improve this? Are there human rights they are missing out on such as rights to access information due not to being able to use the internet fully? Right. Uh, I'll pass the question to the panel. I will uh, kindly ask you to keep your answers as, as interventions as short and as brief as possible so you can get more participation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, different generations of technology should remain on the market, very simply. The stuff you're used to using now 
you will be used to using when you're 80, and that stuff will look old to the children in whatever many. So we need a range of a retro, modern, easy to use, disability and accessibility coded. We need to keep them on the market so that we do not have upgrades that are actually um, obsolescence uh, by design. And that's the first way we keep people of all generations able to keep communicating with each other in the ways they're used to. So old fashioned dumb phones for a start, keep them, keep them going. Yes, we can have another intervention here from the floor, ma'am. Buenas tardes, voy a hablar en español. Mi nombre es Anabela Rivera, vengo de Guatemala. A mi edad normalmente contamos historias. Les quiero compartir una anécdota sobre una buena práctica que se está dando en nuestra región Centroamérica. En la cooperativa Zulabatsu de Costa Rica inició hace algunos años un proyecto muy exitoso con relación a formar niñas y mujeres jóvenes en las prácticas del Internet y las diferentes TICs. Eh, luego, con el apoyo de Google, nos convocaron a, alguna, a algunas organizaciones centroamericanas que estábamos en la línea del trabajo con la libertad de expresión o el trabajo con jóvenes y logramos articular un colectivo que se llama TICAS, la voz de las jóvenes de Centroamérica. Les voy a platicar lo que ha sido para las niñas, jóvenes, mujeres indígenas, rurales, en mi país, Guatemala, este programa. Y realmente coincido con muchos de ustedes y con muchas de ustedes en sus preocupaciones, pero quiero compartirles sobre todo lo que para estas niñas ha representado este programa como un espacio de esperanza y de accesar no solo a las tecnologías, sino que sobre todo al desarrollo en sus vidas. Este año graduamos las primeras 100 niñas, mujeres indígenas rurales en Guatemala sobre eh, todo el aprendizaje de tecnologías. Ellas mismas eh, ganaron un tercer lugar en una hackathon que acaba de realizar la UNESCO en, mi, en nuestro país con chicas de Guatemala, El Salvador y Honduras. Este proceso, además de un proceso de formación en tecnologías, tiene un componente muy fuerte sobre los temas de prevención de violencias y sobre todo de racismo, de la lucha contra el racismo y la discriminación. En los demás países de Centroamérica ha sido un gran éxito el programa también. Nos encontramos ahora, como siempre, en el desafío de que estas chicas se gradúan y les toca regresar a sus comunidades indígenas, rurales, a seguir haciendo trabajo en la agricultura o sacando tortillas para comer. Sin embargo, sabemos que quedó la semilla de la esperanza en sus vidas y que probablemente en el futuro vamos a ver chicas de Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, celebrando haber tenido la oportunidad de este proyecto. Yo sí soy una gran optimista del esfuerzo que se está haciendo desde el IGF en América Latina y en cada uno de los países en donde estamos, porque creemos que estamos contribuyendo en algo. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you very much for your report, for interesting information. Uh, I would like to go back to Nidhi, still uh, concerning the last question. Sorry for not having yeah, no, heard you, Nidhi. You have no the floor. Thank you. Um, sorry, I just wanted to uh, give some quick thoughts on, on the previous two comments that were, previous two questions that were brought about for elderly persons and the youth, and also inclusion of children and genders, um, etc. I just want to uh, bring this point that for elderly persons, when we're talking about youth um, and when we say universal access, it's the ease of um, design easy to, we always say in disability language when we create material, if you create an easy to read material, it's, it's the best because it addresses people across different capacities and ease of design addresses across abilities, across age, etc. So really keeping that while engaging with the infrastructure and design. And the second thing, um, speaking about 
um, children and other diversities to also think that when we say disability, it's not a homogenous group. When we say children, it will also not be a homogenous group beyond the, beyond the very obvious diversity of culture, geography, et cetera. We also have to understand disability does not only remain with youth or women, it's also with children. You may have children who are autistic and we've learned a lot today in AI sessions and tech sessions of how much of uh, the internet is being used for education and social interaction for people uh, living with invisible disabilities. So with children, that might be a consideration, thinking about various invisibilities that we have, people who have severe anxiety issues, who have the social um, interaction issues in, in, in spaces like these. So multiple modalities of engagement, like Marianne mentioned, would be very important. And the most important thing is, we have a panel and we're discussing about gender, to really think about the, the spectrum of gender and to think about inclusion in terms of um, persons who identify as transgender, fluid gender identities, because um, internet governance for them becomes really, really important. They face a lot of isolation, ostracization in uh, physical communities. And there have been many articles written in personal narratives and research papers that this is the space where they rediscover themselves and can engage with the world. So to think about further diversities and make it holistically inclusive, again, going back to the slogan which has been quoted before here, and I'm repeating that, is nothing about us without us. And when we're trying to create spaces and policies and research papers and knowledge production to include the people we're talking about or we want to bring solutions for. Thank you again, Nidhi. Hinata, let's make it more yeah. interactive. Yes, uh, so I'm Hinata Kino, one of the roaming moderators you have seen on the floor saying that you can come here. This space is yours too. So you can also make your intervention from here. Uh, so now we have a very interesting intervention from uh, the coordinator of the DC in small island developing states, Tracy Hackshaw. Please, Tracy, take a seat among with our speakers. And I also remember everyone who's on queue, I'll come pick you up in a second. If you want to do the intervention there, it's fine, but I also can come here on the stage. Thank you. Keep to one minute, please, so everybody has a chance to speak. Thanks, Tracy, pleasure, you have the floor. Thank you. So coming from a small and developing state and from an underserved region, it's important to realize that there are levels of, I guess, um, separation you have to consider. So not only do you have issues of gender, youth, physically challenged, elderly, but they're also in underserved regions. So it's another layer. How do you treat those issues? How do you ensure the accessibility Challenges are solved. How do you bring them to fora such as this to have their voices heard? How do you raise the volume of those voices? That's something I think that we need to work on as well. So it's not only about the gender, youth, physically challenged broadly, but also that other layer in isolated regions and rural um, areas and so on. So I want to make that point and have that um, addressed in some way. Thanks a lot, Tracy. Any comment from our panelists from, from this perspective that Tracy just brought? Vivian. Actually, I had a, a thing to say about the last intervention. Um, when I think about uh, uh, gender inclusion, about youth inclusion, I think about two projects. Uh, about gender, uh, it reminds me of the project of DNS Women, where it helps women to work with DNS in order to they have the, the right and have jobs and everything. And in terms of inclusion of youth, it reminds me of the Shepparton project uh, made by Internet Society last year, where we from the Youth Observatory, among other other organizations of ISOC chapters, we we did a lot of training of inclusion in projects, just like describe that, in order that we can rec uh, recuperate children and the youth and try to uh, include them and engage them in internet governance, internet relation issues. And I think also, in order to we have a better inclusion in the ecosystem, uh, 
um, projects like uh, the BPF gender in the, uh, in the report are very important. And uh, I think that's my considerations for the moment. Thank you, Claudio. Thank you, Viviani. So if we do have a speaking queue that is still composed of Catarina, Catarina Araujo, Shahul, if we have a way to bring them in according to the queue, uh, otherwise I think we have Valentina here for, as another intervention. Could you, could you please come and... Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. You have the floor. Okay, one minute of power. Okay, so I got inspired by the color. Nearly it's uh, purple, blue, green. So I thought queer. I think, and when we, if human rights, gender and youth, for me it was difficult to crack. For a moment I fear was the usual container. But there is a, a thing that I love about the internet, and is the freedom of experimenting and discovering your own identity or identities. And sexuality, it's about this. And if we talk about youth, it's a moment of experimentation, of fluidity. And it's really important. And so, who we really want to have here? Because it's not talking, it's also when at the beginning people were asking for women from the global south, was not a token. But we, are we able to offer the space for all diversity to play and to call and to say? Are we going to out those people? Because the internet is also a place where diversity is punished, but it's a place of pleasure. And I think we need to remind this to each and every one. So I think that if we talk about human rights, yes, they should define everything, but we really need to articulate diversity. And when we talk about youth, and less young, it's really about all the colors that we want to bring in all the differences. And, and it's not about empowerment, it's about giving power. This is power. This is power. The power to speak, the power I can hold, I can continue to talk. This is power. And then there is self-discipline and solidarity. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Valentina. I would, I would uh, ask the panel for a... To... Thank you very much. We like Take that relevant remark into consideration so that because it, it might not seem that the time has passed, but we only have uh, over 10 minutes until the end of the session. So I would like to hear from another friend and then we'll pass to, uh, to another comment concerning this to this, uh, our fellow, one other, and then that's, that's all the time we have. Thank you very much. You have the floor. Can you help her, please? Hi, thank you. My name is Nicole Peter Patterson. I'm with She Leads It in the Caribbean and also Women's Economic Imperative, an international NGO focused on women's issues. <clears throat> what I'd like to point out is that I've heard a lot here this week on a lot of initiatives that are taking place in the gender space with ICTs. Um, I was very happy and one of the reasons I'm down here also too is so I can find the lady from, uh, I think it was Guatemala, who was speaking a while ago about the initiative that they're doing in Central America, because that's the very type of thing we're trying to do. We've done it two years so far, Girls in ICT um, Day Caribbean Hackathon, reaching 1,150 girls in five countries. However, what we want to do is take advantage of best practices. I also attended the Best Practices Forum earlier um, today. So what I'd like to, to put forward is if there is an opportunity that through IGF and through sessions such as this, that we can have an interactive platform that shares actual information on different initiatives that are taking place so that we can make those connections and um, get to the end result that we want for SDG 5 faster. Thank you very much. That was a Thanks. Pretty straightforward call for action. Thank you. Sebastian, would you give us the pleasure of uh, finalizing our interventions? Merci beaucoup. Donc, Sebastian Bachelet. Je... Je suis un activiste de la diversité. Le reste n'est pas très intéressant là pour maintenant. Euh, 
Je voudrais dire, je n'ai pas préparé d'intervention, mais je voulais dire plusieurs choses à la suite de ce qui a été dit aujourd'hui. Oui, cette salle n'est absolument pas faite pour ce qu'on est en train de faire, mais elle n'est pas faite pour les jeunes, pour les euh, euh, enfants, pour les femmes, pour les hommes, euh, ni pour les vieux, ni... elle n'est pas faite pour ce qu'on fait. Donc, euh, si un jour on veut réfléchir à comment est-ce qu'on améliore euh, le forum sur la gouvernance de l'Internet, c'est peut-être euh, arrêter d'aller dans des lieux qui sont faits pour nous formater et pas pour euh, améliorer la fluidité dans tous les sens du terme que vous voulez. La deuxième chose, c'est que on peut tous rêver que tout le monde, un jour, sera dans la même salle. Mais pour moi, ça, ça s'appelle le monde. Et l'outil qu'on a pour ça s'appelle Internet. Alors faisons en sorte que les 6 milliards d'individus sur la Terre aient accès à Internet et développons des outils pour permettre à ces 6 milliards de participer à la réflexion. Parce que si on voulait les avoir tous dans cette pièce-là, nous n'y arriverons jamais. Donc il est vraiment important qu'on réfléchisse autrement, qu'on sorte un peu de la boîte. Et c'est important qu'on ait des enfants, c'est important qu'on ait des jeunes, mais c'est aussi important qu'on ait des vieux. Et je me revendique comme étant d'un de, de, de cela, pas très vieux, mais vieux. Et donc, euh, euh, et, et arrêtons d'opposer les uns aux autres. Nous sommes tous uniques tous avec des différences. Euh, on peut dire qu'il y a des endroits où euh, on n'a pas accès à Internet. Dans mon petit village euh, de la Bourgogne, euh, eh ben, c'est très compliqué d'accéder à Internet. Euh, des gens doivent faire euh, quelques kilomètres de voiture pour pouvoir utiliser leur téléphone portable. Euh, ça n'est pas que dans les pays en voie de développement, c'est aussi ici que ça existe. Et donc tout ça fait que notre diversité à chacun, elle est, euh, elle, il faut les mettre ensemble et faire en sorte que on trouve des solutions collectives. Mais ne rêvons pas d'être tous ici dans la même salle. Et merci beaucoup à tous les panélistes et à tous les participants. Thank et bienvenue en much. France. Thank you very much, Sébastien. Once again, interesting call for actions. We had Heather, Gibbling, uh, Heather Borbling uh, listed but she, uh, as a speaker, but she unfortunately had uh, uh, connectivity issues. We have time for one more of our participants' few. Uh, be very welcome. Thank you very much. You have the floor. Thank you very much. I'm Chiza Eron, a Ugandan human rights lawyer who is part of the Media Legal Defense Initiative delegation to IGF. Um, my concern could be twofold. One, it's good and easy talking about youth participation within the context of uh, peace, but we have people, youth, women, and uh, children who are locked up in war in Yemen, in Miami, in Somalia, in the Congo, DRC, and in other war regions. What strategy does IGF have for them? Where, what is their place in all this internet governance? So we must address that situation and ensure that uh, we use these internet resources to solve the war, to expose abuses that are against women, children who bear most of the brunt of this. Um, closer to what we are discussing now, um, there is a lot of shutdowns that go on. Increasingly in Africa, in my own country, there is a tax that is uh, on the necks of uh, social media users, and the worst affected are the youth, and of course the women. And we need to to have recommendations and engagement and communication with policymakers, especially governments that are returning to taxes, to laws, and other seeming legal maneuvers against freedom of expression, especially online freedom of expression. I think those are some of the things I would have want to IGF to discuss, because I know it's a, we are meeting with a few minutes, how can we discuss them? There's a very serious issue. On, on the internet sh shutdowns, I can uh, understand that the IGF has been discussing at least reporting the, the, the latest developments. I'm not so sure about best practice about those. And the first problem you mentioned mounts on, amount, on, on a series of other serious issues that we have. Thank you very much for your participation. Our, our time, in, in fact, has finished, but we are going to go through our panelists again for a, a a last round of closing remarks and thank you very much for your patience and for your rich participation. Uh, uh, Madeleine. I just wanted to say thank you um, for 
for everyone who's, who's spoken, whether or not you've been up here or, or down in the audience, this has been very helpful. I've been taking copious <laughs> notes. And one of the things that I just wanted to point out that I, that I really appreciate, and I think that this conversation has brought in a lot of nuance to a lot of these conversations um, that's often lacking from a lot of the sort of mainstream narratives um, on these topics. And I think that's really important. And just something as simple as, um, you know, one of my colleagues up here bringing up the idea of when we're talking about sort of the protection of rights for women and children, being sure, you know, that we're not infantilizing them at the same time. Bringing this kind of nuance to these conversations is critical. Um, and so I would just say thank you for everyone who's brought that level of nuance. Um, and let's keep that in mind as well, that um, you know, these issues are not binary, they're not simple, and it's really important to, um, to allow for that kind of um, complexity. When we talk, for instance, for the, the right to education, it's also the right to education that will prepare the next generation for the digital age. So it's not just you know, these rights to access to education, but really taking that step further um, and asking those difficult questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madeleine. John? Yeah, um, well, I, there's one thing I would like to, to mention, um, and just as a preface, I have never voted conservative in my life, and I cannot imagine any circumstances in which I would, but the a conservative prime minister uh, initiated a review uh, into what he called the commercialization and sexualization of childhood, uh, carried out by a very distinguished scholar, Reg Bailey, um, and I think if you get a chance to look at it, look, Google it and have a look at that report, because what that documented in a very serious way, and it was well received, critically received in, uh, in lots of quarters, was the way in which aspects of what the internet has brought to the modern world are undermining, uh, particularly the self-confidence of young girls and creating certain sorts of ideas and images about what the perfect girl looks like and so on, particularly, and being projected again and repeated through social media and so on. Uh, and so we need to think about that aspect of what the internet is doing and think about responses to it. One of the things that, uh, that flowed in part from that report, for example, is that we in, in the United Kingdom, we're going to try to restrict access to legal adult pornography to uh, only to adults, so that at least children, and by this I'm including a group that it's very, very difficult to imagine participating in internet governance conversations, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, and so on, in particular trying to limit the, the possibility of very young children being exposed to images on the internet which cannot possibly be doing them any good and certainly cannot possibly be helping them to shape their idea about what sex, relationships, and, uh, and so on uh, are about. Uh, and I just I mention it because if you haven't heard of that report before, commercialization of, of, uh, and sexualization of childhood, uh, it, it would be an interesting thing maybe for you to, to, to have a look at. Thank you, John, for the reference, for the, for the, for the thoughts. Thank you very, very much. Uh, two things. I'd like to just note that uh, 65 million people are displaced through climate change and civil strife military interventions, namely war. The, the most important non-food item for many of those displaced persons is their phone. The second thing I would like to, and that phone is often taken away from them when they uh, reach a particular destination point. Uh, I'll let you think about that. Secondly, um, when I talk about, when, I, when we're talking about diversity, let's get beyond diversity. Let's keep working on the demographic diversity, but could we also add diversity of technologies, diversity of platforms, diversity of application across different generations, um, so that there are many, many sorts of technological um, applications, platforms, tools that allow people to interact in different ways? Because the market concentration of access design, terms of use, is becoming quite alarming and it is completely countering any understanding of diversity in a techno-cultural understanding, which is what the internet, quote unquote, is supposed to be. Thank you. Thanks once again, Marianne, for sharing your experience. Minda? Uh, thank you. I, I would just uh, would like to uh, finish my interve intervention by saying that um, at uh, Internet Rights and Principles Coalition, we think that uh, we have a lot of work to do uh, and we will continue to work to ensure that uh, human rights frameworks are applied to the um, existing 
and emerging technologies by design. Um, I think this would enable um, all the conversations that we have been having here on uh, gender and youth, uh, such as uh, gender equality, the right to access in the internet, the right to non-discrimination in the net internet access, use and governance, and uh, it would also a enable uh, everyone to have their voices heard. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Lillian, you have been kind enough yes. to save that comment so that we have more input from the audience. Let's see if you can still make that comment and have your final words. Thank you. Right. Um, I've been dying to, to speak. Uh, when I initially started, I had more questions than answers. But as I listened to everyone from the interventions from the floor and the rest of the, of the panelists, there's one thing that I think is missing that we have not stressed enough is the issue of um, online responsibility. We are pushing for more women to come online. We are, we are pushing for the youth to come and use these tools, but there's the issue of the responsible use of the internet. It cannot be just uh, you can use and then get abused without you having that sort of uh, responsibility. And uh, before I joined this session, there was a session organized by UNESCO. There's a lot of work being done to preventing youth from online radicalization. And I think that is one of the things that my brother from, uh, from Uganda was alluding to. How do we make sure that youth and women are, who are mainly targeted through these online schemes do get the chance to use and appreciate the benefits of the internet without being pushed into these extreme activities that are happening online. So as we go back, yes, there's the digital security, there's the access to information, but the issue of responsible use. The internet can be used as a tool for, for good and also for bad. That is one of the things that we need to keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lillian. I think you can never voice and stress those issues enough. Viviane? Thank you all. I share with the concerns of my colleague here because we know that internet can be uh, another good environment for youth and women in general. I think the BPF gender did the report the 2015 about the abuse in, online. And uh, I also think that we must include, but we must also teach. We must also, also protect it, these people, these women, these youth, uh, people with disability that we are including on internet. So I want to thank you, uh, the panel. I want to thank you all, uh, all as well, all the organizations and initiatives that deals with human rights on, on internet, gender, and youth, and say that you make our internet more inclusive and diverse. Thank you all. Thank you, Viviani. Nidhi, thank you for your participation, for your reach, sharing your final words. Um, thank you, everyone. It was really a thought-stimulating discussion here. Um, I think I want to continue in one line um, the pieces that my fellow panelists have been talking about, that we need to be very, very conscious of the online and offline congruence and uh, some of the issues and barriers that offline presents of women's safety, of harassment, of trolling, etc., and accept that a lot of mirroring happens online and use maybe some of the offline solutions or build solutions together, which spans online and offline lives of people. Um, the second thing, and I want to leave it at a slightly positive note, is that for many of us, for youth, for women, for people with disabilities, for queer persons, with a lot of diversity, internet has been a site for liberation, of freedom, site of really, um, having a voice of amplifying voices. And I think that's a very positive experience that someone can have. It's a, it, for many, many, it is a site where enabling environment is created, where people can exist and be and grow. That is why for us to have inclusive frameworks and principles and shared principles becomes even more important because when an enabling feature becomes a barrier a site of so many positivities. If we face barriers or problems or access issues within these, you feel like the world is moving forward and you're stepping back. So again, that inclusion should be the norm and not just, um, and shared principles have to be through nothing about us without us. Thank you. And once again, our appreciation, Edie. Olga, 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Claudio. Just a final word about what I said before. We all have different focuses and we all aim for changes and inclusion and uh, better treatment of different groups within the internet. I, as I said, I'm very positive. I think, as Nidhi said, I think internet has been a great success, uh, tool for our life and our freedom. I would repeat what I said before. If we have an idea, let's move to, from declaration to action. When we knew 10 years ago that there were a few people from Latin America participating in internet governance, we thought about the school. The school has trained more than 3,000 face-to-face um, fellows and thousands more uh, remote. When we thought there was no book about internet governance in Latin America, we did the book. So let's move from the declaration to action. If you're doing something, try to enhance it, that would uh, uh, it bigger, or if you think there's something to be done, go for it. Thank you. Thank you once again, all the panelists. I thank you. Uh, I, I understand that there were still a couple of hands raised. As the theme mounts and as the discussion builds, things get more interesting. Unfortunately, we still, we still have the constraints of time. But anyway, thank you very much for your time, for your patience, for your engagement. And, and I, I want to, on much. a final note, ask everyone to come up the stage if you want to take a picture here of our speakers, because this is our idea of the IGF, an IGF that you truly participate, that you are part of setting the stage, you are part of uh, setting the agenda. So if you want, please come, everyone. Let's take a picture of all the audience. And thanks for our uh, remote uh, speakers, our MAG organizers, please. Come. And I'm sorry for those who didn't get a chance to, to do an intervention, but we still have this moment crystallized here with everyone who joined us and wanted, wants to come on stage. Gonna give a, a couple of minutes or so for those who are on the back as well. So thank you very much for all the amazing interventions. Please join our speakers. And once more, sorry for the remote participants that had connectivity issues and our remote present presenter as well. So please join us here on stage, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And remember that you set the agenda of the IGF. If you like this format, remember to uh, discuss it on our taking stock session, yeah? Uh, is it important for us to have more interactivity in the sessions? So join us, please. I'm gonna give a few more seconds just for everybody to arrive. And get ready to take your picture. Hey everyone, this is it. One, two, three. Now, IGF, come on. Yay, IGF. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.